Hi guys and welcome to the third episode of Failure Friday where we talk to my friends and clients and mentors on how failure has propelled them further in both their personal life and their career. And today we have a good friend and client, Cindy Taylor, who is the founder, creator, and inspiration behind a soul survivor. Oh no, excuse me, a soul survivor. That's a rap song. A positive survivor, which is a foundation based off of her traumatic experience in childhood and it is sole purpose of helping people in similar situations or who may know someone in a similar situation. And uh, without further ado, Cindy, do you want to add to that intro? Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me and wanting to hear all of my interesting questions. Uh, but A Positive Survivor was started because I went through childhood sexual abuse from my stepfather and wanted to be able to help others that had gone through it since I not only survived all of that, but thrived in spite of all of the things and kind of what scars it leaves on you and throughout you know many different levels uh, of your life you know interpersonal relationships working just being a friend just many things um, and I started that and I'm kind of still in the midst of starting it all up to be a nonprofit foundation and that's where I'm at which I think is, we talked about this a little bit earlier, I think that is what is the most beautiful part of having you on here. But so many people that I talked, everybody has something they're super passionate about, or most people maybe, not everybody. But when they get on the topic of starting a foundation or starting something to give back to that particular topic, they really get stuck in the beginning. And also, I just wanna thank you for being so transparent. Since I've met you, you've been, it was one of the first things Cindy told me when she came to my office and sat down was about this experience. And it took me aback because I'm an incredibly transparent person. I overshare, share, and to meet someone like Cindy who just threw it out on the table was like just a glass of cold water being poured <laughs> on because that, that type of transparency just isn't very common. And I, I think we didn't talk about the foundation part. I think us meeting after maybe, what was it, six months to a year? And you were like, I really want to do this. And right. we sat down trying to map out the next steps. And um, I just, I'm so appreciative of Cindy because there's so much, so many more people than we think that have gone through. It's so, con I personally know at least a dozen people who have gone through something similar than um, what Sydney has gone through, but they are not near as open. So her being able to sit down and just throw this out on a platform, and the first five minutes we're about to talk about this is just monumentally important for this space. So um, I think that's a great transition into the next question, which would be, and I don't even know how you're, I don't even know how you're going to kind of line this up with failure. How do you look at that experience as failure? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, I hope you well, have a drink or something. I guess because the, well, when you look at that, when you look at it from that angle, it's because I was the person that kept my family together. I was the one that- um, Before or after? Um, during. During. Okay. While all this was going on um, in my family, since I didn't say anything, I knew that if I said something, it would unravel Camelot and the perception of having a perfect family. And I knew I would disappoint people by telling them that because we would have to move or move out of the house that I was in or something would have happened and I would have been 
the one to blame, even though nothing was my fault, and I totally understand that, but when you're seven years old, 11 years old, 12, whatever, that's what you're thinking that I have to be able to keep my mouth shut so that everything can be status quo and you don't upset the apple cart and you just sweep it under the rug and the elephant is in the room all the time, but you just continue to walk by. Give us some context here. What was the period of time specifically as it pertains to your failure to communicate you knew that you should but you chose not to which i which i'm interpreting as what you perceive now at least as failure what was Correct. the period of time that Correct. went by and give us a illustrate who this person was to you i mean a stepfather can be someone that's close to you could be someone far away was he in the home was he outside of the home no he was the only father figure that i had because he came, my mom was a single parent. She was divorced from the time I was, I think a year old. And he came into our lives, I think I was in kindergarten. So I was probably about six, five or six, somewhere around there. This is in the seventies. And it started when I was a little over seven um, and it ended when I was 15 um, and I, I knew from the beginning there was something wrong that there was at seven or about to be eight right I knew that I remember thinking when I would go over to my friend's house like I wonder if this happens to them and I even thought a couple times about asking them and saying, hey, you know, does this happen to you? But while I'm thinking that and processing it, I'm still, somehow I just knew that they would have said, were you crazy? Like, no, that doesn't happen in my house. And and then action would have had to exactly. You weren't ready for that. Exactly, exactly. But how old were you specifically? I mean, obviously, you don't remember the month or day, but how old were you? Oh, I know exactly. I know. I remember exactly when it was because it when was you knew June. it was wrong and you chose not to. You chose not to say, okay, this is happening, but you could have. Right. I knew it was wrong and chose not to say anything and then as the as time went by and things progressed it even more cemented the fact that I knew this was not something that happens to my friends and of course as I got older found out that it happens to one in four women and one in six men but wow. that's only going by what is getting reported. And just like exactly. women who get sexually assaulted, you know, on a date or in college or anything like that, so many women are ashamed and won't come forward and stand up because, well, maybe I was drinking or maybe I let them on or whatever it is, all those different things that would go through your mind and you choose not to say anything. So, you know, it's, it's just a vague analogy, but when you look at, you know, childhood sexual abuse and whether it's by someone that's in your home on a regular basis or it's a grandparent or an uncle or a neighbor, family, friend, whatever, again, you look at the statistics and it's only the women that or men that actually report it and the more research that I've done as I've gotten older met out of the all of the people that do not report it men are the biggest um, of course because it's it's a completely different mindset of 
from a male perspective as far as being able to come forward and be okay with what happened to them, that they were the victim, that nothing they did was wrong, um, but to be able to process that and go through everything, whether it's through therapy, you know, individual therapy, group therapy, whatever it is, it's, it doesn't happen. Well, I think just being a victim in general is really difficult for the male ego to digest, right? And Without not even do something with that, as intense as sexual abuse. Being a victim in general is so detrimental to the male ego. It's just hard for them to admit defeat. And something well, like this is just debilitating, right? Exactly. And, and to because I think it's more so where they feel that just like people could look at any situation and say, well, why didn't you open your mouth? Why didn't you say something? For a man, it's even more so, well, why didn't you fight them off? Like, you know, you kind of go down that, that physical road. Right. Um, even that. boys. Exactly. Exactly. And the ego Children. of the um, admitting something that, um, and especially if it's a male that is abusing them, it's really, really difficult for a man to, because it, it immediately, the perception is, and I don't know why, but the immediate perception is somebody will think that I'm gay, which... Mm -hmm that one has nothing to do with the other when you look at all the research of men that were abused, you know, as children, as toddlers, as adolescents, whatever, has nothing to do with whether or not somebody determines later or whenever in their lifetime to say, hey, um, you know, gay, same with same with the female. If it's a female that was abusing them, it, ha it has no correlation. But I think that's the perception that most m males would have. And that's another reason why they don't say anything. And that's a good forward. segue. So what if, you know, there's people here that there could be 15, 16, 12 year olds watching this, but more than likely it's going to be an adult who's gone through this, who hasn't said anything or an adult who is close to someone who they know has gone through something like this. Based on your experience and what you've done with all your research and what you're doing with a positive survivor, what advice, what soundbite would you give someone who hasn't spoken yet that could learn from your mistake? or who could relate to your mistake, what is their next step, or, some, or a tool that they could use to take the next step. Because the next step that you've taken is, it was easy, and we're not gonna say it was easy for you, but it, you knew that was your natural next step. For other people, they just hit this wall. So like, right. what, what good's gonna come from it? How much is right. my psyche going to change? What tools can you advise them based on your experience? The, what, what I experienced when I was in my, when I was an adult, up until my mid to late thirties, compartmentalizing and stuffing it further and further down is just like trying to hold a beach ball under water. I've heard you it's say a, that. Yeah. It, it's exhausting. It's exhausting, and I got to the point in my life, um, I was 36, 37, somewhere around there, and I, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I could not compartmentalize and just pretend it didn't happen and let everything just go by the wayside because I was, Mentally and emotionally, I was really, I, I had just gotten to my breaking point. Um, and I could not have any type of relationship with my stepdad at that point. Um, 
So I think, let me pause right there. I don't know if you want to share this, and if not, we'll, we'll edit it out. But sure. uh, what was different than from the stories that I've heard in the past and the research I've done was that Cindy's stepfather continued to be in her life Correct. after this happened. So maybe talk a little bit about that because that is also something that is unfortunately incredibly common where you do tell and it still doesn't play out like how you thought it would. So right. if you want, please feel free to go into that because I think that's really important. That That's where sure. a lot of people to come back to like, oh, well, my mom or my, my sister or my, this so is still with this person. Why? Right. I don't want to tell. Right. And when I was halfway through my sophomore year in high school, it was January of that year, so it would have been 1984, when everything came out and we moved in with my, with my mom's sister and for me, at the time, you know, granted, I was going to therapy all the time and, you know, our whole lives had turned upside down. So my mom, my sister, and I were living uh, with my aunt for a little bit and then moved into our own apartment. And I thought, okay, this is great. And then when I, my mom had a doctor's appointment, and I went with her to it, and my mom suffered from migraines, and I started also when I was nine. Who knows, it could have been part of the stress uh, and everything else I had to live with at the time. But um, the doctor, who was a good friend of my mom's, called me into his office, and he said, what are you doing? had no idea what he was talking about because, you know, 15 years old. And he said, you know, your mom's really upset and your sister misses her swing set in the backyard. Essentially, get your shit together, buck up, and go home. So, that's what I did. And I wow, figured, okay. I don't okay, remember this part. <laughs> this <laughs> is, terrible. yeah. And it's funny, years later, I mean, I knew he was It's an not asshole. funny, Cindy, nothing about this Oh, no, funny. no, no. But I mean, he's he was an asshole. That was just his personality. But I, I thought about it off and on years later. I'm sure he's long dead by now, but it made me wonder, did he have someone in his family that this happened to and maybe he never believed them or maybe his or brother to him oh, right or he himself was um abusing he was his coming kid. to you as a victim and was like hey i've kept this a secret for this long you can right. do it too right or he was doing it to his own kid or yeah his, his brother was doing it to their kid and it was oh you know what you just you just keep your mouth shut this you just go along you don't you know you just stay the course. This this is your lot, and this is what you were given. Mm -hmm. And um, I went home, and I just kind of, just what he said, sucked it up, and I went back to school. Um, all the kids in my high school knew what had happened. Of course. And then, well, there was no HIPAA back then, so... Um, my therapist ended up getting on a phone call when I was on with my boyfriend at the time and pretty much spilled the beans and told him everything. And that's how it got around my, my entire school. So that was really fantastic going into my junior year when I came I like back that. to school. Yeah, it was great. That's um, but, but even, but kind of going back to, you know, what you had said originally is, you know, if, if someone listening to this is, has never shared it with anybody, what I can tell that person or persons would be, I know it is incredibly difficult. It will be one of the hardest things you will ever do. But when you get through to the other side, you will feel so much lighter and unburdened and 
just better about every part of yourself, you know, through the process that it's, it's the way to go. Because I, I think that keeping it in, knowing what it was doing to me mentally and emotionally, it was eating at me like, like a disease that, you know, there's no cure for. But at the same time, um, had I not stood up and said, you know what, I, I just can't do this anymore. Um, I don't know if I'd be here right now. That's the point that I got to. Um, and when I went through everything and found an amazing therapist and did the extraordinary hard work of processing everything and, and taking each thing that the therapist would give me and work on it and, you know, kind of go to the next step. It's, um, I learned a lot about myself and I just know that he was a, you know, piece of shit kind of person um, is the best way that I could say it. Um, and if people are going through it and have said um, and have spoken about it or have spoken up, I mean, and have told other people and maybe weren't believed, then you need to, you have to keep talking. You have to keep and until somebody listens to you and, and takes you at your word and believes you because this is not the type of thing that anybody would just say as an off the cuff thing and oh by the way you know this happened when you know and, and make it up it, it's it doesn't work like that I think even if someone did make it up. You're never gonna look like a bad, I would rather look like a clown for believing someone that lied than accuse a victim of telling a lie. I, I say this every time something happens in the media and they're like, oh, you know, they could be lying. Innocent until proven guilty. I get that that's the law, but as a victim of abuse myself, not sexual abuse, but physical abuse in a relationship, being told that you're lying when you're telling the truth is, mm -hmm so traumatic to your ego, your self-worth. Like it's just, I can't, I can't imagine being a child and being right. called a liar because it goes against everything you've been told your entire life that far. Tell the truth, share, be kind. It just, it, right. it, it's like a wrecking ball into the foundation that you, that you built as a child. How, I want to touch on one thing you said actually before I move on to the next part, therapy. And we, I'm probably going to talk about this in every single episode, no matter what's happening. I think one place where people fail and they don't want to look at it as a failure is they don't find the, ther the breakthrough therapist that Cindy is talking about on the first try. That takes people years sometimes to find a therapist that is the right fit for them. Whoa. So if you're going through something that Cindy's going through and you don't find someone that fits like a glove, don't give up because that is instrumental to you getting through something as traumatic as this, right? Correct, correct. And here's what you have to remember. Just because somebody puts MD after their name doesn't mean that they're fantastic. Right. And I've had Amen. terrible therapists throughout my life and I, thank God, have had a couple very good ones. Um, for example, when all of this happened, um, we went to the famous Peters Institute in Philadelphia where I was interviewed by one of their top doctors that deals with um, sexual abuse and went through everything, answered all his questions, and I said, I'm fine, everything's okay. And at the end of the interview, or session, whatever you want to call it, when he was asking me everything, 
he said when it was all over, um, there was another doctor in the room and my mom, and he said either she's totally fine or she should win an Academy Award. Well, oh regardless God. of all that, I was never, I, I never went to therapy after that. And um, I think that for people that don't know your situation and that might play devil's advocate and be like, well, she could still be lying. Her stepdad admitted to this to some mm -hmm. extent, right? He, mm -hmm. admitted yeah, he admitted to this. It never went to jail. Nope. S still, she was still returned back to the home. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I don't think it continued after this, right? No, it didn't. No. But she still had to live with her abuser. I mean, it's just, because I know that's gonna happen. I'm gonna get some type of DM. Well, was he ever prosecuted? He wasn't prosecuted, no. but he admitted to it, to a licensed therapist. Yes, to his psychiatrist. Um, and the psychiatrist had to, you know, because as a psychiatrist, you have to report it. But this was back in 1984 and laws are different everywhere. We were in Pennsylvania. So they, nothing was done um, at the time. And obviously my mom knew that's how everything came out because the psychiatrist had to legally tell my mom. Um, and that's my mom asked me one day after school, she's like, you know, is this happening? And I just started to cry and I said, yeah. And that kind of started everything. But then um, after that, the, when it comes to therapy, you know, I tried a couple times in my 20s you know, went to one or two and then, you know, you, you do things, you forget, you know, you start to have bad times, just like anything, like any part of life, it's a roller coaster. But then you uh, decide that, hey, I have to get to a point where I can't do this anymore. And And then you just, you know, find someone, but not only do you have to find the right therapist that you feel comfortable with because you're bearing so many emotions and so much bad, memories and history and so many things come up you also have to be prepared to do the work because mm -hmm. you could go to the the best therapist in the city if you are not going to do what they're asking you to do and whether it's um hey i want you to tell me exactly how you felt you know, the first time it happened. I want you to, you know, really close your eyes, remember all the different things and et cetera. If, if you're going to give lip service, it you aren't going to progress and you, you're wasting your time. So you definitely so you need to be- Mentally prepared to read Exactly. It. Yeah, you have to be, and not everybody is there, obviously at the same time, in their life um, but that's just something that if you have never told anybody or you maybe told one or two people but you know it didn't really go anywhere and you still have issues and still have answers and still have um, you know byproduct you know from from the abuse, which, you know, you'll... That's gonna last certain... your whole life, though. You Absolutely. Can't, I don't want anyone to ever draw a par parallel between this podcast and failure, and baggage is part of it. You are going to live yes. with that. I think it's developing the tools to cope with that, which Correct. is just, you seem to have, I'm not gonna 
say master, but it, seem, but it seems that you have mastered the process, the coping process, because you're so open. I think well, it's easier for you to digest the tools that are given to you. Well, what, what my therapist, Dan, has said to me, he said, Cindy, you have not only survived, but you have thrived in yes. spite of everything that has happened to you. And that's the most profound thing that I think of every so often when I'm having a hard time is, you know what? I'm better than all of that nonsense and whatever it is that's getting me down because I survived this, went through it, came out the other side, and I'm still here. Which speaks to the name a positive survivor, which I mean, truly has so much meaning for you. Right. Um, how do you think that, I just, I hate saying the word failure because I look at you and I just see such a triumph. But when we say failure again, for listeners, audience members, we're talking about her perceived failure of waiting so long to say something. Right. And that, you know, that might not be a failure for everyone. For Cindy, that is her perceived failure in this entire thing. How do you think that particular failure has shaped you as an adult? And I particularly want to know how it shaped you as a mother and separately how you think it might have shaped you in your career. Little tidbit about myself, I have never been sexually abused, not as a child, but I am paranoid of it happening to my children because I know so many people I have clients that come in and for whatever reason, it just, they just whoop, it's like a the croissant roll that just comes open and I learn, and I have so many that this has happened to, I am paranoid of it happening to my children. So how has it shaped you in those channels, Cindy? Um, well, of course, you know, you teach your kids from the very beginning, you know, the whole good touch, bad touch thing. Um, but I think I was a little more hyper vigilant than the average parent when it, com when it came to things like that. Um, like if I ever had like a weird, like sixth sense about something, um, which I don't recall it ever happening, but I just was very in tune with, um, you know, where my kids were, who they were with. I mean, could something have happened? Of course, absolutely. Um, I mean, anytime your kids go outside your door over that threshold and, and off they go, nine million things can happen to them. But I think that, you know, gave them enough, um, information that they would know come and tell me if there's any problem you know i'll never um think they you know you're making something up or or not you know telling the full truth how did you tell like your that. children about this uh it was it a one-time thing or were you just kind of layering it on as they got older well, it was when, when it got to the point that I couldn't have the relationship with him anymore, I said to my husband, you know, I won't have my kids not have a relationship with him, but oh, wow. I can't be around him anymore. And there wasn't really anything that happened at that point. Um, and it wasn't until, oh, now I'm trying to remember. Um, he died, I think, nine years ago. I think it was 10. Yeah, maybe it was, or maybe it's all, maybe it's gonna be 10. Something like that. Um, so I had to tell them, I mean, they knew a little bit before that, but it, it was 
a couple sentences because my kids, when we first said something to them, my husband did it because I knew I couldn't do it without um, breaking down. Um, but my kids were, I want to say like maybe 13 and 18. So, oh wow, you waited a while for your yeah. son. Yeah. Um, so, and then once he passed, um, and you know, we were the only people at the funeral that weren't crying, which that's because none of his friends knew or anything, and that's a whole other story. But, um, you know, we kind of went into it a little more then because I, I think when he, when Kevin first told them, he just said this happened. He didn't say for how many years. So I think my kids at the time thought it was a one time thing. And then when they got a little bit older and could understand a little more, then it was. Does that make it that much more worse to where it would stop them? That's just the straw that broke the camel's back that would make them stop loving Well, them. that was that was right around the time that uh, we had moved from Pennsylvania to Florida. So, and my son at the time was active military. So they didn't see him. So it wasn't, um, it, it didn't impact them, but I think it helped them understand with a little more clarity um, what, if, not that it, not that whether it's one time or a thousand times, it's still not something you ever want to have happen, but I think then they understood it a little bit better, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Are you comfortable with people after they watch this reaching out to you? And how should sure. they do that, Cindy? Well, they can, I have a Facebook page, a positive survivor, and We'll put that uh, up on the screen or in the caption for people so they can just have a link and go straight to it. And where sure. else? Uh, and you could give them, I'll put my phone number up there. They can uh, text me. They can, I'll give them my email. Um, and they can contact me whenever and if they have any kind of issues. Um, my goal would be to, after speaking to somebody, depending on what their situation is, to try to help them um, find a therapist uh, to be able to get the help that would get them, you know, on the right path to working through everything and getting to a better mental and emotional place. Yes, and just also having a community, man. It's a place where people can talk in different stages of this process, I mm -hmm. think is so important, so, so important, because it's just, it's getting better, I think, especially from when you know this, this happened to you. I think more people are talking about it. There's more safe spaces, but like you said, especially for men, especially for you know women maybe outside of their 30s who grew up in a time period like you did where it just wasn't okay to talk right. about and so many of of you guys were thrown back into the homes where it was happening i i think they need a community more than anyone else and but it's still so important to get connected i want anyone who sees this who's gone through it or knows someone just to send the video or send cindy's information who cares if they don't use it at least you gave them an avenue to maybe take that next step. Right. Um, Cindy, thank you so much for coming on. Of thank course. you so much again for talking about this. Guys, Anytime. I want to thank my viewers. I want to thank my clients and my friends for making this worthwhile. This is the stuff that's so exciting for me. I feel like giving you guys a platform to speak about what you're passionate about, just it connects people. And um, I hope everyone has a blessed night. And Cindy, I'll connect with you offline. And Thank you so much and have a good night.
Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Good night, guys. See ya.